So I um, trained and I still practice as an emergency physician. And one of the things that I started noticing around when I finished residency was that a lot of the amazing things that AI was doing in other industries had these direct analogs to the problems that I was facing as a doctor. So when you're in the ER, um, you know, there are all of these questions that involve predicting something really important. Like when I'm looking at this patient in front of me, is she having a heart attack right now based on all of these laboratory results, her electrocardiogram, her past medical history, um, or another patient. Is this person at high risk of having a really bad thing happen to them in the next day or two, such that they should probably be in the hospital so they can be monitored, or are they safe to go home? So all these things involve taking in a complex set of data about a person and then making a prediction on some important quantity. And that's exactly what um, Netflix does when they're trying to figure out, is this person going to keep watching this movie? It's what Amazon... So so all of that stuff was starting to happen, and I was starting to see all of these connections between the amazing things that were happening in these other fields and the, and the, the things that I was hoping to build tools for um, in medicine. So, um, so I got interested in, in AI in many ways, just... Um, inspired by these clinical problems that I was trying to solve. So that led me down this path of, of research. And I think that um, in the course of research, one of the things that anyone who does not just AI research, but any kind of health research knows is that it's really hard to get access to data. Um, I was lucky because for a while when I was first doing this work, um, I was actually employed by a healthcare system. So I had a right to touch those data. And that let me be productive and, and learn and write papers and, and build things. But I think um, it's both inefficient in the sense that, um, you know, you, there are lots of people who have great machine learning skills, but don't you know, have the luxury of being employed by a healthcare system and having access to that data. And it's also just not fair in the sense that, you know, like there are a lot of people who are locked out from being able to do this work because they don't have the connections or the administrative capacity to, to do the work. And so that bottleneck, I think, is a big reason why when you look at the healthcare system, unlike a lot of industries, even though we have a lot of data, we don't have a lot of tools that like you go to your doctor and that doctor is typically not going to be using an AI tool to help you and, and deliver your care better. And I think a big reason for that is because of this bottleneck in data access. So the, the two um, organizations that I helped um, co-found are speaking to that need. So Nightingale Open Science is a nonprofit. Um, we raised um, money uh, philanthropically from foundations that are interested in this intersection of tech and society. So Eric Schmidt's foundation, um, Ken Griffin, um, Gordon and Betty Moore. And so the, we, we uh, raised money from those foundations and we used that to build data sets in partnership with health systems. And those data sets speak to what I think of as like medical mysteries. Um, so why does cancer metastasize? So we have these, um, this one data set of um, scanned breast biopsies from um, women who have had mammograms, who have had something abnormal in the mammogram, they get a biopsy. And then we follow those women along for years and years and years and see what happens to them. So we have this rich image of a breast biopsy, and then we know what happened to the person. And so we can start making headway on why do some cancers metastasize and others don't? Um, what is cancer? What, what does it look like? Can we predict it in advance? Um, and so that's Nightingale. So Nightingale takes those data sets out of the healthcare system um, after de-identifying them, and it makes them available to researchers so they can publish papers and push the frontier of knowledge forward. Um, so that's a you know one data set at a time solution, and it's very labor intensive, and it doesn't necessarily get what I think of as like the market involved in this problem. And so the other organization that I helped set up is a for-profit company called Dandelion Health. And what Dandelion does is it um, sits in the middle of a network of big, non-academic, very diverse health systems from all across the US. And we um, aggregate data from those health systems. So imaging data um, linked to patient outcomes over time. Um, and after, again, de-identifying those data, we bring them over onto our cloud platform where people who are interested in building clinical products to push patient care forward can access those data and build AI products um, as a way to democratize access to data. I think one of the very perverse consequences of people not being able to access data is that right now when you look at the market for healthcare AI, what a lot of companies are competing on is basically access to data.
they're not competing on the quality of their products or like the innovation. Like it's just, do you have the right to access data or not? And that, of course, torques the market in this very, I think, unproductive direction where um, the the market and, and the ability to enter the market is based on privilege and um, being able to buy access to data or just having won the lottery and just having access to data to, to begin with. Um, and so when we step back and think about, well, what do we want the market to look like? I don't think we want it to look this way. We want the market to, to work in a way that's incentivizing people to build better, more innovative products, not incentivizing people to lock up data and control access to it and, and monopolize it. And I think, sadly, right now, um, the, the, the market looks much more like this um, this this monopolized resource and rent seeking from from that resource rather than a, a world where people are just um, competing on the quality of the product and the consumer can assess the quality of the product and so that bottleneck is not just a problem for developing products um, and and you know I, I know just personally of a few startups that they have a great idea. They have an agreement with the hospital system, but as they're waiting for the hospital to actually sign the data use agreement and deliver the data, they run out of their Series A funding. And so a lot, there's just this graveyard of ideas that never happened because of these bottlenecks. So that's on the development side, but it's also on the consumer side. So there are you know three algorithms, let's say, that claim to be able to detect stroke. How do you know which one is best? So you can't, as a consumer, assess the quality of these things because there's no data set where all of those things can be put to the test. And that's, I think, a huge problem when you think about AI because the whole secret sauce of AI over the past 10 years has been open data sets where people can compete and there's a holdout that nobody gets to see and everyone just you know, uh, gets a place on the leaderboard based on how they're doing on this thing. And so the lack of that in healthcare is a huge impediment to, to progress and it's a huge impediment to the market functioning well. I think there are a lot of lessons um, that the U.S. government, as it seeks to regulate AI in healthcare, can take from another, I think, very successful instance of regulation, which is drugs. So um, before the FDA was regulating drugs, it looked actually a lot like how the, the market for AI looks now. So the way it looked was basically you just had to write down on the label what you put in the, the, the little bottle. So if you put in cocaine, it was like, great, you could you just put down cocaine and the consumer could decide whether this is a good idea or not. Um, and I think that's, that's a little bit where we are with health AI right now is the consumer is looking at like, oh, does this increase my billing? Uh, is, is the workflow implementation, like there are all these things that are, I'm not saying that they're not important. It's good to have workflow, you know, integration and, and lack of friction. But the thing we'd really like to know is, does this thing work? Just like with the drugs, you don't just want to know what's in it. You want to know, does it actually improve health? And so, you know, even though it, the FDA on some level regulates drugs, but really what the FDA does, it regulates information about drugs. And so the FDA says, your drug needs to have an outcome that it's trying to improve. So let's write down that outcome and let's dialogue between the pharmaceutical company and the FDA. Like, what is the thing we're trying to do here? Like, what's the yardstick? And then the FDA, the second component is the FDA says, great, now that we've agreed on what the drug is trying to do, go run a randomized trial and show us that this drug improves this outcome. And I think similarly with AI, you know, I think it would be very easy for a regulator to say, what is the number that this algorithm is trying to predict. Like all algorithms have that number. And sometimes it's not a number, sometimes it's like, um, you know, you wanna produce a reliable answer to a medical question if you're dealing with a, a generative language model. But there's always a thing that we're trying to do. It's an application. And so we can agree on that. And then we can say, great, we're not just going to take your word that the algorithm is producing that number accurately. We're going to show uh, in an independent data set that your algorithm has never seen. Is this thing working? And so I think that um, uh, that that analogy, at least for me, has has helped me see that there's a very feasible path forward. It does rely on that you know, definition of an outcome, like what is the algorithm producing? And then the demonstration that that algorithm is producing that prediction well in an independent data set. And I think that would work really well, just as it has for drugs.